Tenakwe John Clark. Tenakwe ki te Ngāti Whatua o Rake. Uh, Nga mihi ki te kōpapa o tēnei rā. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you very much for the invitation from the Asthma and Respiratory Foundation. It's a pleasure to be here again. I come spasmodically and it's a delight for me to see the work that one of the um, senior researchers in our group, Lucy, is um, doing too. And um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Ines. She and I have worked together in advocacy over quite a long period. Okay, I'm going to be talking about home truths, which was the subject of a... Uh, Bridget Williams' text that I wrote, but also it was the topic of, um, it was the subject of Lucy's doctorate, which I helped to supervise. <laughs> so we, we are passing the baton on. Uh, I like to start with um, a picture that reminds me that we're in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and every day I walk past the council flats at um, in, on my way to work from Arrow Valley where I live and there's this lovely um, um, paintings on the wall of the warrior in the whare and it reminds us that that's the foundation of the way that we should be doing things in New Zealand. Interestingly, we just had a Chinese delegation and the, of the, all the things that they were interested in was the fact that in Wellington City Council um, that there was very good quality housing in the centre of the cities, which they couldn't believe because in China, most, as in most countries, the poor are right on the outskirts of the city. So there are many things that we can be proud of in New Zealand. So I'm going to talk briefly about housing quality. I'm going to touch on the thing that Lucy did so ably, housing-related hospitalisations and death. I'm going to talk very briefly about our community trials. And I know uh, Ennis's reaction is sometimes what we got, well, of course we knew that. Why do we have to do it? But actually, it provides a strong evidence base that involves physicists, engineers, public health people, economists, to actually look at the different aspects of it. And then to um, continue the... Um, upbeat note on the progress that we are making, I want to talk about some um, intervention programs that we've been involved with. Um, uh, not just our community trials, but um, secondary prevention programs. And I'd like to acknowledge, where is she? Cheryl's moved. Where's Cheryl gone? Oh, <laughs> Cheryl there. Cheryl Davies, who is in um, Kokori Marae, who I've worked with for maybe two decades now. So we've worked in partnership here. So um, another one on the NEST study, which is looking at how to stop babies going into hospital. Uh, the rental warrant of fitness that Lucy and I have worked on closely. And finishing with Heitupu Manaho, which is Cheryl and I are being social entrepreneurs here as a way of trying to improve respiratory health. Okay, we've started... Um, as I said, about two decades ago, and many thanks to you as the taxpayer who've, um, taxpayers who funded our work through um, um, two decades through the Health Research Council. And um, I think it's really important to think that a lot of the innovations actually come from um, government-supported action to um, follow ideas that people have had. And, and this has been such that in New Zealand we're now considered one of the world leaders in how to improve housing and potentially respiratory health. Okay, so just to remind you of things that working in the field, you probably all know, New Zealand housing is on average 90 years old. And only a third of it is even minimally insulated. Despite that Warm Up New Zealand program, the previous government decided that a third was enough and they were stopping it. And if you remember, that was one of the things that actually united the, the parties that are now in power. Um, the Labour Party, the Green Party and Winston Peters, New Zealand First, all agreed that we should finish this job and I think was one of the kind of um, values that... Um, um, drew together the coalition. Uh, now, the thing that really concerns us in our group is that it became very clear that a lot of those differences that um, Lucy highlighted were also mirrored in tenure. Um, we know that um, poorer rental housing is in poorer condition than state housing. Now, that might come as a surprise because that was not the message you've been hearing for the last decade, but it's true. 
or owner-occupied houses. So it goes, on average, remember we're talking on average, private rental housing, state housing, and owner-occupied housing. And of course, because um, rental housing is largely older housing, it was built often before there was a building act or a building code, and we've had very, basically no regulations to improve it. So if you're renting in, um, in rental property, you're likely to be in a much older um, house with less thermal mass. Now the indoor environment, where we are, particularly if we're young or we're old or we've got some kind of chronic illness, that's where we are 90% of the time. The rest of us are about 75% in time inside our house. And it seems kind of when you first hear this, and that's actually quite consistent across the whole of the OECD, the whole of the developed countries, we always pride ourselves as being an outdoor people. Um, but this comes from the time use survey, and in fact, it's we're not much different from the, any other country. So what our homes are like is absolutely critical, and yet we have no department, no ministry that actually, whose function is to look at the indoor environment. Um, I'm currently doing some work with Shama Bel Yaakob and Alan Johnson from the Salvation Army, um, looking at um, for the Minister of Housing to do a open to do a stock take of all um, information that the government has about housing. And I'm I would must say in relation to what Julian Genta said to us, and I think we're very lucky to have her in those joint positions. What has been very evident is there's been very siloed policies. So because nobody specifically has had the job of fixing up indoor houses. ICA does the energy efficiency. Um, Ministry for Environment does outside um, environment. MB does building standards. But nobody actually says, how can we improve the quality of our housing? So I think we are in very exciting times. Uh, now, as you've all been aware, we've had quite a dramatic um, decline in home ownership. Now, this is worrying, of course, because your home, if you own it, means that you have an asset that you can draw on both for starting a business or if you have an illness, you can take out a mortgage or whatever. If you don't ha own a home, if your parents don't, haven't owned a home, if your grandparents don't have a, own a home so that you would actually inherit some money, we're starting to get not only very big differences in income, but actually most dramatically big differences in inequalities in wealth. So apart from, the, apart from the environment of the house, the houses also represent the kind of nest egg that we have. Uh, so 36% of households and 50% of the population rent. Now, those two figures, which come from Lucy, so I trust them, <laughs> uh, are, are interesting. And that is because people who are in rental housing tend to have um, larger households. So that a lot of the households in the suburb that were built in the 1950s um, for um, a traditional family of a husband and wife and three children, they now may have one or two people living in them. Uh, and But actually flats have, have got people with children in them. A lot of children are now growing up in flats uh, and not of combined families. Now, the, our work has shown, we've, we've, be, we've gone in and done building assessments of 5,000 um, houses in our studies, and it shows that there is a significant difference between rental houses and home ownership. Um, the brands, the Building Research Association of New Zealand studies, also showed that rental houses are in worse condi condition than home ownership. And uh, the, the, one of the agencies that has taken notice of this, and I really applaud them, is Statistics New Zealand. And they've decided that this is so important that in the next census, you will be asked about damp and cold and mould. And you'll be asked to um, see something that we developed in our studies. Is there, does all the mould in your house, and a third of us have mould in our houses, add up to an A4 bit of paper? And um, that's also going to be part of the general social survey. So for the first time, we're going to have an idea of just how good or bad our houses are. And of course, if you don't measure things, you don't think it's a problem and you don't try and fix them up. Uh, so we think that's very important and I'd urge you all to um, do that. We're the only country in the OECD that doesn't have a proper 
tier one statistic, as they call it, and independent measures of housing quality. So this is one thing that we tended to ignore. Uh, I, I show this picture because, um, well, when do you think when do you think this house was built? It's in Petone, that um, in Wellington, 1930s. It's actually built in 1905. The Liberal government, which was the precursor of actually the sort of the National Party. Um, that was the reforming government at the turn of the century. They had this project that, that actually workers need to be in good houses so they could get to work. Actually, the ones that they built in Petone were too far away from the railway station and um, didn't work very well. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but they um, nevertheless, uh, they've stayed, they're still quite solid. They've stayed and um, um, now sold off and people are still very proud of them but it looks exactly like the houses that you might build now, almost the same. So you wouldn't be driving around in a Model T Ford, the same that was in you know, 1995, but our, we still build our houses the same. We're very, on some things, we're very slow learners. And this is of course one of the first state houses, just of the airport in um, Auckland, uh, Wellington. And um, there's a street of them around a little village green. And this is where Savage, the prime minister took the chairs into the house. So the WHO recommends minimum endorsed uh, temperatures of 18 degrees minimum and if there are children up to 21, children's bedroom. But we found that in all our studies, because we have these little data loggers, which are the same kind of things that you, um, they actually measure the temperature in containers that have got food, very accurate. Children, mostly children's bedrooms are an average of 14.5 and children's bedrooms are on the south side often of the house, which is the cold side and the master bedroom, the mistress bedroom, is on the front of the house that gets the sun in it. Um, we found that insulation and heating each improved bedroom temperatures by um, just under a degree. But in our housing heating study, um, the worst children's um, um, bedroom in the asthma study was minus four degrees which is pretty damn cold. Uh, and of course, um, people say, oh, well, you know, the, the, it doesn't really matter what the temperature of the room is because you're breathing in air and your, your lungs warm it up. But if you've got compromised lungs, um, that's really problematic. And, and actually, Jap new Japanese studies that have just come out showing that older people with COPD, if they're in a cold room compared to one that's about 18 degrees, their blood pressure goes up quite high. So it's a stress on the body, um, actually, to be in a cold bedroom. Uh, I'm not a... Um, building scientist or a physicist, but I have the pleasure of working with lots of doctors and people in that way. And there was definitely pathways. This is, this is logical because cold indoor air is harder to heat and we know that mould grows better in damp air. Um, one of the peculiarities of New Zealand's weather is that we have very high rainfall usually. So our productivity comes not from having fertile soils, but from having... Um, having lots of rain, usually. <laughs> uh, and so mould grows better in damp air, and that's why so many of us have mould in our houses. Viruses, we now know, survive for longer on cold surfaces, and this is very um, problematic for some of the um, diseases that um, our children have. And I've mentioned that. And also blood, of course, you know, blood is a very important part of our body. It um, can thicken when cold and more likely to form these little plaques that make the heart... Um, irregular or um, precipitate strokes. This is a glorious example of some of the mould in one of our studies we went in. This is black mould and it's probably stachybotrys. Um, we're just um, waiting to see whether we've got um, funding to actually look at these moulds more closely. We're working very closely with Finnish colleagues here. And one of our, the questions is that if, if um, the gypsum boards, you know, the, the, you, every, we use in our houses quite a lot. If they get damp, they are an ideal medium for growing moulds. So we, this is on the outside, but inside you could get a really nasty concoction. So we're interested in pursuing that. So I was asked also to speak about social determinants. 
this is this is really this is this is my variation of and this is tragic and this is I'm I'm delighted that Jacinda Ardern, our new prime minister, has this as her and her government's main priorities. Um, because if you focus on children, and of course for for all of us, and particularly for Māori and Pacifica, children are at the heart of a whānau. So although we don't, we can think about households. It's particularly poignant when we see the pictures of Emily to born. Um, and a quarter of our children are living in households in poverty, and I do hope we can get this cross-party agreement that's been discussed by um, Judge Beecroft, the new children's commissioner. 50% of children below the poverty line live in private rental housing. Now, I've already said that this is worse than living um, the, the conditions of state housing, where there's been um, the state has taken on the obligation to try and maintain them better and 19% um, of them are in housing New Zealand homes. The other thing which is a real risk in terms of crowding, close contact infectious diseases, is in fact living close together. And of course, if somebody's laid off or the shift work, if someone is working, um, earning below um, a livable wage, people will crowd together in houses though we've done quite a lot of work saying nobody from whatever ethnicity likes living in crowded houses for any length of time. Um, my mother used to say, um, fish and guests stink after three days. That was her favourite Sicilian um, proverb. And actually, if you look, she is very hospitable. But basically, you all know that it's lovely to see people and then it gets slightly difficult, and then if it's too long, it's you start to make find quite difficult. So there are a lot of families that are actually moving from one brother to sister to um, friend, and this is not good for anyone, particularly as the children are often having to move schools every time this happens. So again, I think this is one of the drivers why you see that higher level of... Um, 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 f diseases that Lucy talked about um, because Pacific people um, live in crowded, more likely to live in crowded households. And, and sort of disturbingly, when you think about what is that cocktail that um, drives illness, 9% um, of um, people in the last census had no form of heating at all. So not only does that mean they have no form of heating, but they have no um, hot water for showers or a bath or whatever. And work by my colleague, um, Michael Baker, which I shouldn't steal his thunder, he hasn't announced this yet, but um, I will. <laughs> uh, that it seems to be that rheumatic fever has, seems to have two pathways, um, that um, Staph A infection, um, Staphylococcus, infection. One is through the skin and one is through um, um, the throat. So if you're in a household where you can't afford where you can't afford to have showers and everybody likes to keep clean, but if you can't afford electricity, it's quite difficult. So this is where you start to see that, you know, why can't with 85% 80 renewable electricity in New Zealand, why can't we make it affordable for people? Now, um, we call this fuel poverty in our area, um, a very fine piece of work done by Rosemary Goodyear at Stats New Zealand um, calls this um, um, energy insecurity or energy hardship. And uh, the growing up in New Zealand study, you look at the proportions of people who, these are people with nine month old babies, those of you who've had babies, as a friend of mine who is a doctor said, when I, before he saw these figures, I used to say to the mother who'd come in for a respiratory condition, go in and keep your, uh, go home and keep your baby warm. But how can you do that if you can't afford the electricity in this damp, mouldy house? It's very difficult. And we had our medical students looking at children under 15 admitted to hospital. Um, we went and asked the parents who very kindly talked to us, even though they were very stressed with um, a child coming into the children's ward. Of course, that's hugely upsetting for anyone. I had it once myself. I can remember. And of these, children, of these families, half of them lived in homes the colder that they would like. And again, the same thing of unable to pay their electricity, even a higher rate than um, from the census. And um, just 7% uh, of them had been unable to pay their electricity bill. So um, uh, that was the case with Mrs. Fuller um, Mulionga. Um, uh, had an oxygen machine but couldn't pay for the electricity and there was some very small bill. 
Now, um, this comes from my um, um, colleague, and it's really been covered by um, Lucy, but um, my colleague, um, Neville Pierce, um, looked at what the Ministry of Health has started to do some work in this. They call these housing sensitive diseases, and you can see that familiar list there. Bronchi bronchiolitis, we think there's some relationship indirectly with acute rheumatic fever, and so it goes down. And we can then look through these, they all have categories in the ICD-10, and then we look to see what the hospitalisation rate is like. And um, this is slightly difficult to read, but at the bottom, the Ministry of Health records here, um, I want you to look at the um, last column here. So here we are looking at if there was no difference um, between, if these factors that we know which are um, um, these diseases, if they did not differ by housing at all, quality, we would expect no difference. Um, but in fact we find even though we adjust for age, sex, ethnicity and deprivation, you have a 3.6 times um, greater chance, so we're looking at the yellow line at the bottom, um, we're looking at a risk of um, hospital admission in this group. And this is by factors that are actually determined by the Ministry of Health. So if you knew you had a, sort of almost four times the risk of um, being hospitalised, remember it's close to $3,000 if you go into hospital for one night, why wouldn't you try and improve ho housing? And this is... Once children have been hospitalised, tragically what happens is they're much more likely to go into hospital again. And we're trying with our colleagues in the well homes to say, well, if a child's been in hospital once, we, we know that poor housing is going to contribute to that. Let's go in and fix their housing before they go home again. And actually that's proving um, there are some district health boards, some areas that are sort of marvellous like that. But nevertheless, we're, um, we're uh, slow to say um, we need to go get in and fix housing. We're training a new group of medical students, and this was Operation Housing. This was, um, the, I was very touched actually, I felt myself slightly tearful. This was in Cuba Street Mall. They were so committed to trying to, as, as, as Lucy was saying, the medical students were saying, well, we know this, but what do we do about it? And they did this as an example of, they, they um, did a little drama about a child um, who had died from rheumatic fever. And, the, and in the foreground here, the, the picture at the front, that one of the students is comforting the mother there. And it was very moving because, of course, these students do see children dying. So the robust research evidence, I'm not going to go through all this, but just to say we have um, done a lot of these studies and I thank you again because they're not cheap and, and companies have helped us, but mainly you as the taxpayer have. We've done the insulation study, which what was the impact of putting insulation into houses? Heating, what was the, impl um, what was the effect of having insulation and heating, and, um, and as well. And then in the housing, we did insulation in the injury study, and then we went in and set a builder in so that people didn't trip and fall. We've looked at what happened in the warm homes for elderly New Zealanders. We've insulated the houses, and then we said, we'll give you $500 over winter, and you can, uh, heat is your medicine. You must make sure you have your heater on. And this is one of the um, projects that has also um, had an um, influence on the incoming government, and they've been announced that um, there are a variety of groups who will be getting this Heat is Your Medicine project. We looked at social housing and found that if you were managed to get a social house, you were two-thirds less likely to actually get into hospital the next year. And the other ones I'll talk about briefly. OK, just to... We did get it into the, we're very colonial still, so if you get a paper in the British Medical Journal, people are more likely to read it. It's very strange. And with my, it was, we looked at uh, housing all over different parts of New Zealand. Um, this, is, um, this was in um, Nuhaka and Mahia, and um, one of the beautiful marais that um, Nata um, helped rebuild in the 30s, and his sister did all the tuku-tuku patterns. And um, 
Um, so this is people listening about this study. In these studies, for those of you who don't know about randomized controlled trials, which I imagine most of you do, you take a group of people who agree to be in the study. They, have to, they don't pay any money. They give us our time, and we give them our help. They're helping us to create knowledge. So we took, in this case, 1,400 households all around New Zealand. Some were state houses, some were private rental, and some were home ownership and we made sure we had a good representation of Māori and Pacific. And then we said, OK, you will get your home insulated, but we're not sure whether it's going to be the, over the first summer or the second summer. Then we take everybody's measures, huge number of measures. Uh, we insulate randomly half the homes. Then we go back the next winter and we repeat the measures. And the only difference is that one group of houses are now insulated, the other's not. And therefore, we were able to say, if you're in an insulated house, it raises the temperature to almost a degree, and your health benefits greatly. So um, that's what I've just said. There were two things that were really important about this. One is that the houses were warmer, less damp. Uh, and the, the other thing was that the occupants um, in the houses used 23% um, less energy. In other words, this is contributing um, to um, making the houses more energy efficient, and um, if you can use less energy, then you're going to be lowering carbon emissions. Um, th this is just saying, of all the things that you can do to save money and reduce carbon, you would want to do the things below the line. This is called a marginal abatement curve. Above the line, it costs you money. And the most expensive thing is coal um, and trying to clean up um, coal-fired um, gas stations, which are terrible. Right down the bottom there, you probably won't be able to see it, is insulating. It saves you money to insulate places. So when I, you might hear me sometimes on the radio trying to get insulation um, program continued, it's because it saves the government money, it saves uh, us as taxpayers money, and it stops children going into hospital. So then, that was only just, we still only hadn't even met 18 degrees, so um, we went, the next one was to actually get heaters in there, um, and we were trying to get rid of unflued gas heaters. Anybody still use an unflued gas heater? Put it in your garage and only use it if, there's a, if the electricity's cut out because it's all sorts of pollutants in there and it's not even cheaper. So and so we took out electric heaters from the households and unflued gas heaters and we replaced them with effective, efficient heaters, heat pumps, wood pellet burners and flued gas heaters. And we found, our question was, does non-polluting, uh, more effective home heating reduce children's asthma symptoms over winter? And, and the households could choose what, kind of, um, choose what kind of heaters they would want. And this did increase um, the temperatures to over 18 degrees. And you can see there were lots of advantages there. People felt warmer, less mold less wheezing and coughing, and one of our people in our group was an engineer as well as a teacher, and she went into um, 214 schools and checked all the absentee records and found that children who were in the homes that had been insulated and had heaters had two more days at school during winter. Now, this mightn't seem much, but actually the new generation um, asthma medications, that would be considered a very good result. So we've done a um, housing outcome mould study. A third of t um, New Zealand houses have mould, I mentioned before. Uh, we did a case control study, heating children's bedrooms, and we found, um, along with the only other study that's been done in Finland, uh, uh, wheezing can be caused by asthma. So this was a new finding. We know that it's not good for a child with asthma to be in a mouldy room. But this is indicating, if we look at wheeze in, in children, young children, as an indication, that um, it was actually causing asthma. So there, this is a, mould becomes a bit of a culprit here. And I mentioned this one, this is the one where we gave those people with COPD, and Cheryl and her team have helped with this, $500 to heat their homes. And even in these homes here, Half the, these are people with COPD, very compromised lungs. Half the participants had homes colder than they like, and they were shivering inside their homes. 
Now, you shiver um, when your, your body is cold and, you, and the body brain says, produce some mechanical um, energy to, to get yourself warmer again. So that's pretty serious. It means your home's probably below 12 degrees or something. Now, we, the, the, both the uh, earlier Labour government and the national government both um, decided to put money into this Warm Up New Zealand program, for which I think that that was, that was really great. And we did a study that Lucy and I were involved in of looking at comparing the first 45,000 houses that were in part of this project. And then, we, um, and then we compared those who hadn't been insulated and found the small but significant drop in metered energy. And we were able, because there were now a quarter of a million people, um, we found that pharmaceutical usage dropped, the length of hospitalisation was less, and interestingly, um, that if you were an older person who had been in hospital for a respiratory or cardiovascular condition, if you came out and your home had been insulated, your mortality dropped. In other words, you were less likely to die the next year. And the benefit-cost ratio of this, which was um, done by people in our group, and Arthur Grimes, who's the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank, or was, so this is, this is a good study. Um, and this is, the, this is the project that was run, and we hope that they're going to gear up again now because the, government has, the current government is committed to insulating all houses in New Zealand. And as someone who pines to have a grandchild, this is my favourite ad they did, half a million Kiwis as snug as a bug in a rug. Uh, I think I'll skip those. We, this is where we did the um, injury one, but that's not really relevant to you. This is where we found that if you were in State House and there was a, they did a healthy housing program, there was a fall in hospitalizations for this group that were at, when they were refurbished of almost two thirds. This is the program that I'm going over a bit because we've got a bit more time. So. Uh, well Homes is a program where Cheryl and her team and we got together with the people in the hut and we said, why are we sending children who are in hospital for these housing-related hospitalizations? Why are we sending them back into the same house? And so there was a group of people who got together, Kokiri Marae, um, people from MSD, Sustainability Trust, and this is the thing, which is a free service, um, that they do. These, these are all around the country, but actually this is the most successful one. 98%, I think, of people have got some intervention. And it will vary, but it can be. Found that bedding is often very cold and damp and mouldy. This is one of the interesting things I found out, that it's not just mould on the ceilings and the curtains, but actually the mattresses are mouldy because the places is cold, so cold and damp. Looking at carpets, curtains, heating, insulation, minor repairs. Uh, making sure that people have the right kind of money that they are eligible for, and um, social housing relocations and ventilation. Of course, our bodies produce quite a lot of moisture. The cooking that we do produces moisture. Um, if your kids have showers and for ages and ages, and don't open the window in the bathroom or put on the fan before they leave, you open the door and phew, all the moisture comes out. So ventilation is very important. Um, there is the other issue that we are very concerned in, um, and where actually it's one of the things I'm looking at for the minister. This issue of homelessness is just um, exploded, but it's not, we know the reasons for it. It's the, um, the lack of um, joined up thinking about um, state housing, council housing, um, and um, what's happened to the housing market. Um, one of my colleagues, um, Neville Pierce, has been working on Housing First, and that continues, it, it, it's looking for people who are homeless sleepers who are put in a house and then have wraparound services. And um, we're using a way of monitoring what it's actually costing people when actually they're, <sighs> what it's costing them, us, and the taxpayer um, when people are living in these tragic, completely stressful situations where they can't really control anything. And then I'm going to finish with um, what has preoccupied uh, Lucy and me for rather a long time, the rent to warrant of fitness. 
we thought, now why do we not have regulations about rental housing when we have regulations about our cars and whether you should wear a car seat? Because this is where we live, most of, the t um, most of us are living, or half of us are living. And it's very difficult for tenants to fix their houses. It's different in other countries, but not here. And there are some wonderful landlords. Some of my friends are landlords. But mostly landlords don't fix their houses. And I think that this is a very strange pattern that we have in New Zealand because this is a commercial service. Um, people are not doing people a favour when they rent their houses to them. They want their house maintained in good condition and they want the tenants to behave. So it's a sort of commercial service which, which is reciprocal. So we developed this with the Green Building Council and it covers these issues of insulation, ventilation, dryness, fixed heating. We field tested it with all the councils in New Zealand. About four years ago, they said, we want to get going on this. We don't want to wait around. And um, we have an app, which you're all very welcome to download, um, uh, to check your house. Now, I'm not expecting you to um, look at this, but these are very, very basic things, for example. Does the house have underfloor insulation? If you've got a concrete slab, then you don't have to, of course, rebuild your whole house. Uh, is there a fixed form of safe and effective heating, the brown ones? And then the orange one underneath on the left, do the bathroom, kitchen, and all bedrooms have some form of ventilation? So these are the basic things. Each of these is based on research that we've done. They're all evidence-based. And as I talk to quite a number of landlords group, what is good for your tenant's health is also good for your building. Because if it's damp, um, you, if it's damp and they're getting infections, actually your um, jib board is probably getting damp and mouldy too. So um, we, can, we can do better in New Zealand. So um, we're looking at a study with Auckland, uh, sorry, yeah, Auckland maybe, but with Wellington and Dunedin, and we're comparing two cities that haven't introduced it, and we're looking at the outcomes, ACC claims, hospitalisation and mortality. And we're looking at Trade Me just to check that um, what's happening to the prices. And the last one, um, which I snuck in last night, <laughs> is Hetipu Manahau. This is um, a resilient plant, and this is, this is what Cheryl and I are doing in Wainui Matamorai, just had a good telephone call from Housing New Zealand and the energy companies. <laughs> we wanted to, we, we said we must do better about um, our housing quality. We shouldn't have to rely on people having enough disposable income um, to keep their houses warm. So we're using our community strengths in this um, around the Morai and Wainui Amata to um, build with Housing New Zealand um, co-housing, that is, it's housing that is based around the marae and has places for gardens and so forth. We're working with the energy companies, um, the, the, the Transpower and uh, Regen Retailers and the Lines Company to put in solar PV so that people um, will have the houses, the idea is that the houses will all be at eight, a base of 18 degrees and that the community will be involved with us in, in helping how to use this electricity and demand reduction programs. And this is some um, little, this is some quote from Cheryl here um, on Māori um, radio. Uh, and this is the beautiful um, wharanui at um, uh, Wainua Mata with Eleonora Hetitz and um, Rangi Hetitz, beautiful weaving and carving inside. Okay, many policy influences. I think the work that you're doing as a committee is really, uh, Renters United is on exactly the same page, Child Poverty Action Group. We did work with um, David Rutherford, the Human Rights Commissioner, to hold the government to account in the United Nations where they were, um, which is worthwhile having a look at, they were grilled for two days about inadequate housing in New Zealand and its impact on children. Um, I'll skip that. Just to say, this is a big issue for all of us, of course, but it's actually becoming quite a big issue for New Zealand. And this we went in, one of my colleagues, Sarah Bear, about telling stories here. We went in and we collected very systematically how often the media now talks about housing and health. And it's now a very, um, it's the main framing. So, in conclusion, 
I hope I've convinced you, though, I, thought my, I think most of you are probably convinced already, that we have a systematic problem with New Zealand housing. It's probably the part of our infrastructure that is the worst. I came through the Waterview Tunnel today, and it was the quickest trip I've ever had into um, Auckland. We spend a huge amount of money on roads. Why don't we spend money on our houses? Because they might be privately owned, but they have public consequences. And I've both Lucy's and my talk have talked about the increased risk of hospitalizations and rehospitalizations. You'd think we'd learn after the first time. Uh, and, and my colleagues have also shown the increasing numbers of deaths that are connected with these. Uh, and the issue about home ownership declining, worse quality of rental housing, that you, well, there is strong evidence here. We can't wave our hands and say, oh, we don't know what to do, because we do know what to do. And we've got these wonderful community groups who are out retrofitting the houses, but we're all going to go out of work um, unless we can do something quite quickly. And I think the policy um, changes that we're emphasising are uh, to stop children going into hospital, to make people comfortable and warm in their houses. And so we're shifting to primary prevention. We don't want children to get sick. And thank you for all the work you're doing to stop that.